Welcome to episode 68 of the Backlot 605 podcast, the premier South Dakota movie podcast. I'm your host, Casey Kelderman. I'm Brian Mensing. Brian, what's up? Uh, it's warm outside, finally. In in South Dakota, when it's 35, it's warm. <laughs> it's, it's, it is, it's take off the heavy jacket and just wear your sweatshirt weather. I was wearing shorts all weekend, and it was the high of 45. It was nice, I, yeah. I love that about <laughs> South Dakota. Be like, what shorts weather? Yeah, it breaks above, 40. Above freezing? <laughs> above, above the freezing level, right? Yeah, that's pretty much it. South Dakota, we love you. I actually just Sometimes had, we hate you, but we, we love you. Right. I just had somebody there talking about how they went to Vegas, and it was like in the mid-50s, and they're seeing people like in parkas and hats and gloves and whatnot. And you could definitely tell the, uh, the locals versus the tourists. Yeah. <laughs> All the tourists were in shorts. Schools and, were canceled because it was 50 degrees <laughs> out. And, yeah. That's usually how it goes, but in South Dakota, what do we do? We just sit around like a bunch of schmucks and talk movies then. That's what we do. And that's what we do every single week. Uh, we have a fun episode coming this week and next week. We have a fun episode every week, but this week is something special. Why is it special? I think, it, well, it's special it's, for me. It's special and, to you in your in, in, your, in, in, your, little, in, your, in your cold in heart. My, in my little monster-loving heart. Uh, <laughs> this is because we're going to be talking Universal Monsters. And you're like, well, Casey, you already did that. Yes, you did. You did that like... Two days ago. <laughs> One day ago. Well, two days ago when this episode comes out. But yeah. See, I'm thinking here. But uh, yeah, this this by the time this is out, our killer countdown is out right now on the top 12 Universal Monster films. So if you want to see how we rank those films, go check that out. But today we're going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be talking about the history of these movies and kind of what they mean to universal the studio how they meant to history in general at the time they were coming out how universal can't seem to get their how groove back yeah and, and then we'll bring it all the way up until today and how universal is trying to bring these monsters back with this weekend's invisible man i'm kind of looking forward to that i'm movie. very much looking forward to it as you heard right before we started recording i kept asking my fiance i'm like well when are we gonna go watch it when are we going to go watch it haven't you already watched like five of those already? Yeah. I mean, I did. I mean, I, I've watched quite a few <laughs> Invisible Man movies in the last two weeks. Oof. Did you like mix it up a little bit? A little bit of Wolfman here, a little Frankenstein, a little Dracula, anything like that? No, I just popped them. It was, I had the, the box sets for each monster gets their own box set. So mm-hmm. I was watching Dracula. And then Frankenstein. Then the Wolfman. Then Invisible Man. And then Creature. Like, Ugh. Yeah, and Invis- the, all the other ones besides Invisible Man started to, to blend into each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one, the other ones stick out pretty well, but we'll we'll talk about that Good. when we get to them. So let's kick it off with a little bit of house cleaning. We're going to bring this up here at the top one more time because this is happening this week. You going to fluff the pillows? We are going to fluff the pillows and do a little house cleaning here. Uh, housekeeping. Would you like me to? Fluff your pillow. Well, that's what we'll leave it at from Tommy Boy. You can catch the other <laughs> reference if you've seen the movie. Uh, but yeah, you can go check out our interview with Mark Christopher Lawrence. Uh, you've seen him in such films as Terminator 2, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, and more importantly, and more famously probably, Big Mike. And Chuck. Big as Mike. Big, Big Mike. Big Mike. Uh, he will be here at the new Bosses Comedy Club in the Ramada Hotel here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, February 29th. 8 p.m. We're going to plug it one more time because this is the week for it. It is this weekend, if you're listening to the show uh, when when it comes out, that is. Uh, But yeah, that's this weekend. Mark Christopher Lawrence. Tickets are available. Just search uh, Bosses Comedy on Facebook and you will find a link to their uh, tickets and ticket info on this. So go check that out. Uh, Very funny man. Very, very humble dude. And we're glad to have him on on the show. He was uh, amazing to talk to. Yeah. And Uh, if you're listening to this after the fact, you missed out on a good show. Yeah. But yeah, let's jump to the box office then, as we usually do every week. Number one, speeding to that number one spot. I think I used that joke again from last week. But uh, number one, Sonic the Hedgehog, $26.1 million. This movie is doing very well for itself. Considering $26 million after taking an over 50%... Yeah. dive that's pretty impressive yeah for it was a uh, a pretty good run between the number one and number two this week uh, i was hearing fluctuating numbers throughout the weekend which one was gonna take the top spot but sonic he he, he does race to the top and <laughs> takes the box office for this week uh yeah people are digging this movie i haven't had the chance to watch it i'll probably watch it when it comes to like streaming this seems more of a streaming release with some of the reviews that are coming out so. I, I had a buddy of mine that saw it and he said for the sake of uh 
uh, live action video game video game, game adaptations that it was probably one of the best ones in the last you know few years which it, it's probably one of the best ever because they all suck <laughs> and that's to the point yes I mean, we'll, we'll, we're going to do a whole video game episode at some point, but we're like, we need some good ones first because we don't want to talk about crap for two hours. So this might be the, the good start for that uh, with Sonic the Hedgehog. But number two this week is Call of the Wild, another CGI movie that probably could have used a, a little CGI touch-up like Sonic did. Like, uh, why? <laughs> number two with $24.7 million. I, I still, to this day, it's like, you know... You're making a movie, there's a lot... I understand the use of CGI with certain things, I and I get that. But, like, there's like, dog like, trainers. I, that, I was going to say, like, Sonic, you have to use CGI because, yeah. you know, you can't play, you can't paint a, a, a hedgehog blue. It's just... You, you just don't do that. No. But, but like, a dog, you like, can put a dog on a boat. Like a bird. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the St. Bernard, I mean, come on. It's not that hard. Yeah. I mean, look at Beethoven. He yeah. wasn't CGI. Look at look at all the Air Bud movies. He was shooting baskets and everything. He was doing all that stuff before CGI. Yeah, I know. They should have gone those. all Air Bud on this. What a missed opportunity. Uh, Milo and Otis. Yeah. The Journey Home. All the 90s movies did did all that. Uh, what was uh, Homeward Bound? Yeah. That's, that, a, that's yeah. a good movie, too. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and that's what this movie seems like, was those kind of movies, those 90s Disney movies, the live action ones like like Homeward Bound and Milo and Otis, like this seems like it would have fit there, and maybe this would have played better if it was on Disney Plus. With maybe. in terms of getting eyeballs on it, I don't know. Maybe but, Harrison Ford was just like, I can't work with dogs. I worked with Chewbacca. I have to work with just CGI this time. <laughs> but even Peter Pettigrew was a human <laughs> being in the in the fur. Yeah, but maybe Harrison Ford thought he was a dog. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Number three this week, uh, Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey. Uh, Box Office Mojo needs to change the name because Warner Brothers did too. Uh, Six point eight million dollars this weekend. Even the name change didn't do much. I, I was say Box Office Mojo is like we're standing on our ground because even changing the name ain't helping you. They'll change it again when the movie comes out on Blu-ray to just Harley Quinn or something. <laughs> like, but yeah, this even with the name change here and in, in its third week out. Uh, yeah, it's 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 not making the money Warner Brothers wanted it to on this film, unfortunately for them. Uh, number four, Bad Boys for Life, sticking around the top five, five point eight million dollars. Six weeks in, doing pretty good for itself. I think it's. It actually, I think it's because it, it moved up actually a, a notch. Yeah, twenty twenty is off to a very slow start. I think for a lot of think people. how bad twenty twenty be if Bad Boys hadn't come out. Yeah, I mean, what's number? I mean, Sonic is probably at number Son- two. Sonic right and Bad now. Boys are pretty much is what's keeping. It'll float. Yeah, for now. Uh, but yeah, I'm. I don't. I've only gone to the theater once so far this year, and that's that's sad. Yeah, what the heck, man? I know. I mean, nothing's gra- nothing's grabbing me though. To Except go for the Invisible the Man. Invisible Man will be my first like big anticipated movie to go see this year. Yeah, yeah. So that and that, I think that'll kind of be the kickoff to now. Maybe we'll have something every week or every other week to go watch in the theater, but. Uh, number five this week, rounding off the top five, Brahms, the boy to $5.8 million. Why did you not go see this? This is like right up your alley. Uh, it is up my alley. I liked the first one. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I, I went and watched it in a theater all by myself, and there was no one else in the theater. It was fun. Uh, and that's what I've heard this box office was for this movie, too. Uh, that it was fun? No. Or that it was empty? That the theaters were empty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have heard nothing good about this movie. I... When I watched the first The Boy, I watched it, I think, like, second weekend out, and I heard mixed reviews. I'm like, okay, I will go watch it then. It, it, it has mixed reviews. I like doll movies, and it was better than I thought it was going to be. And then this one comes out now four or five, like, four years I was late. I say. It, it's almost four or five years later. Is it's it been a while. A little too late, maybe? Yeah, uh, it definitely is. I mean... Would would you think this might have something to do with the a confusion with the title as well? Being that it's the Brahms, then it's The Boy too. Mm, no. I mean, the doll itself, I, I think, has become somewhat, not really iconic, but you recognize it. Like, if you see that doll, the pale white face in the suit, like, you can probably recognize that's from the boy. Yeah. So, I think it has a somewhat recognition to it. Uh, I think part of the problem is this movie was delayed for, like, a year and a half. Like, this was supposed to come out, like, well, last year at this time, I think. And, too, I'm also looking at, like, the overall, like, current theaters that it, it opened up at 
didn't this, open up in a whole lot. This is the kind of thing where this is the amount of theaters that a movie would have if it had been opened up for like three, four weeks by now. Yeah. You know, a little over 2,000 theaters when you figure like like Birds of Prey, three weeks, it's, uh, you know, it's still up over 3,500 theaters. You know, even Bad Boys is ha- has it's six know, weeks out. Six yeah. weeks out still has 800 more theaters than it has. It's mm-hmm. like, does the. That that tells me that the theaters as well as the the company behind it just doesn't have the the th- they don't think it's no yeah it was it's I think that's all the studio behind it is we'll put it in as many theaters as we think we can probably make a little bit of money on in this movie and so far that's I mean, not the case they probably they probably have made pretty close to what their budget is probably isn't very much worldwide they're at a little over eight and budgets at ten oh so, so not even including marketing yet yeah. Yeah, that's all right. This then might be the last time. <laughs> then we don't need a boy three. I was saying this might be the last time we see the boy. Yeah, uh, until he fights Annabelle or Chucky coming soon. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I will. I'll eventually watch that movie. Unfortunately, just because I feel like I like the first one, I should probably watch the second one. I but feel an obligation. I feel an obligation. I do. I but really I feel do. an obligation to wait till Netflix. <laughs> yeah, I feel an obligation not to pay money for it though. So yeah, I I I, I don't know. Hard earned people made made this film. They did, and they they spent a lot of time and money on it. I'm sure, but it it just didn't grab me. So yeah, fair All enough. Right, let's jump to the news then for this week. We have a little more news than we. Then we had a few weeks ago when we had like nothing. So we're at least getting some new news this week. Something. At least yeah. something. I think the big let's start with the big news from What's this week. What's the big news? We get our first look at Robert Pattinson as Batman. You know, when I first heard about this, I was like, Oh, this is a bunch of you know, somebody's making something up kind of thing and then because you see all the like leaked photos from yeah. the sets and stuff like that, and all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, that Vimeo account belongs to the director. This is literally 11 hours old," mm-hmm. and I think he looks fantastic. Yeah, the Matt Reeves did release what a 20 second video it, or something I don't even like think that. It's even that long. It's just a quick snippet of of what the Batman suit kind of looks like. And it's, it's dark. It's gritty. It's purposely inter- like dark yeah yeah you know, so it's hard to kind of see the internet was complaining because they didn't show the entire cowl so it like cuts off right where is the the, the, the you bat know horn, the bats i don't know what you call those ears ears i guess but yeah. at the same time too like for me and like the the ears are you know yes it's iconic to batman but you know you need to basically show that you know he's got the jawline he has the jaw, he, like, jo- he has, has the jawline the jaw. to be batman yeah so I think that's what Reeves was going for. And then did you see those leaked behind the scene pictures as well? There's a few leaked ones of Batman on a motorcycle. Yes. Yeah. Did you see those? I two? did. Okay. Yeah. Th- I think the suit looks great. Pattinson looks great in the role. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm excited for the film. I'm excited to see where he and the direction he, they take with this. And I I will flat out say just for the sake of what you know we have seen of what Pattinson looks like as a normal individual. Like, he's one of those ones that right now, unless he proves me wrong, that I think is going to be able to pull off the dynamic of being both Bruce Wayne and Batman. Um, whereas we have had those instances where, like, the person's a really good Batman, but a really bad Bruce Wayne. Really and then you have Bruce George Clooney, who wasn't good at either. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll admit that. I'll say even he's like, <laughs> yeah, sorry, guys. You're right. But, you know, yeah, the, you know, we've had a good Bruce Wayne, but not mm-hmm. such a great Batman sort of thing. And I think he's going to be... He's going to ride that line, I think, very well of being able to pull both. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Just even his look, he, he like put him in a suit, like a, a normal suit and tie. Like, yeah, he looks like Bruce Wayne, and then you put him in the Batman suit. Yeah, he looks like Batman. Yeah. So I'm excited so, to see our, our first real look at this. So movie. more outsourcing of our uh, our American superheroes to the British. Yes, give give <laughs> good act, just give good actors roles and the, the roles in these big. Yeah, comic exactly. Movies, so. I mean. British, American, whatever the case is, just give me a good quality actor to to back up that, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I like the fact that we're finally kind of this many years in to finally say, yes, an Academy Award winning, an award winning actor can make a superhero movie because, you know, it's not just, oh, I'm making a movie just to make a movie. Like, there's actual work that's being behind these, to, you know, the love and the attention they deserve. All right, next piece of news that we got here is a, uh, a another video game adaptation. 
that we are going to be getting. Uh, Eli Roth is in talks to direct a Borderlands video game adaptation. First, Brian, have you ever played Borderlands? No, I haven't. I know of the games. I know the style of the, in terms of like the visual style of it. And I, I can't see this translating very well. Um, I mean, I guess Eli Roth seems like a, a solid choice because it's a very <sighs> gritty. Yeah. But I mean, I would, I would almost like to see, cause have you ever seen the movie, a scanner darkly, uh, with what, Keanu Reeves, what movie, a scanner darkly? No. Oh, I highly recommend it. Um, Keanu Reeves, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Woody Harrelson. Is it Robert Downey Jr.? Anyway, Woody Harrelson's in it. Anyway, um, it's basically what it, it's everything's filled in live action, and then everything has gone back over it and cell shaded. Um, and I think that being that this is a very cell shaded style of video game, that that's what they should do. Yeah, I think they'll go probably straight forward with this movie. Um, if it gets off the ground, who knows with video games movies anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to see Eli Roth keep doing different stuff. I haven't watched his latest film, The 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 House with the Clock in Its Walls. How's that for an image for uh, a scanner darkly? Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> uh, it's a good movie. Yeah, but Borderlands, I've, n- I've never played the game. I obviously know the iconic image from it, which is taken straight from Taxi Driver. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, maybe this will lend itself right towards being a, a film adaptation i i'm not sure but here's the thing too i don't know is until you see the words in production how many video game movies are announced and never see the light of day this is definitely one of the ones where it's, it is a hot property that 2k puts out and whatnot uh it definitely has the story behind it to be able to justify a movie and whatnot but at the time you know it's like until i actually see the word hey borderlands is in production I want to see this movie's already shooting and we get some stills exactly. from the movie or something. That, and that's what I'm getting at. And that's the same with like the Uncharted movie. I don't think that's ever going to come out. Like, uh, Yeah, Tom Holland, Mark yeah, Wahlberg. Any any version of it, I don't think it's just, I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. And, I mean, I think studios are really waiting for someone else to take the big risk, go full-fledged, $100 million com- or, uh, video game movie, and it makes bank at the box office and it's critically acclaimed. Before everybody, then we'll start seeing Borderlands and Uncharted and all these other Call of Duty will probably get it. Like all these things. Call of Duty's probably, already been talked about being making a movie. Halo. Everything has. Everything Call, has. Uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto's been talked about. The, like, the all this stuff. Like is, the only but, one that's had somewhat of a successful franchise, and this is using the term loosely, is Resident Evil. And that's because they're made cheap and. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. And I think that's more of the team behind it than, yeah. than anything. But yeah, I think as far as studios go, they're going to wait for someone else to make to make bank, and then they'll follow it up with what whatever video. What, what video game do we own that we can make a movie off quick? Right. That's that's eventually what will happen. So we'll wait every, to see what every, happens. Every with big the Borderlands. Every here. big movie makes a de- or video game makes a decent amount. Somebody's already shopping the movie rights. Yep. All right, so let's move to the next piece of news, and this is uh, this kind of sounds like a video game movie right here. What is uh, this? Nicholas Cage will in the movie where Nicholas Cage will be playing himself. Oh, okay, okay, okay. He will be reenacting some scenes from very famous Nicholas Cage movies, including Face Off and Con Air. I'm okay with this because I want to see Nick Cage with a mullet again. I just want to see Nick Cage play Nick Cage. And, and reenact Nick Cage, and, and Nick Cage, Nick Nick Cage is. Yeah, I I was already excited for this movie. And this just makes you more excited. It makes me more excited. I mean, first of all, do you think if you're going to get do, a wide release though? I don't. It depends which route they want to go with it. Like if they're going full fledged, this is kind of a meta comedy kind of like film. Like, like being John Malkovich kind of thing. Yeah, or like even taking some of. The, I don't know what direction they're going with this. Really, I'm and, all for it, no matter and what. It's, and it's not like Nick Cage is really like that. He's like, not a bankable but, star anymore. No, no. Uh, yeah, I think it'll probably be a limited release with the film. But hearing that if they can get like legit reenact scenes from Face Off and Con Air that are studio movies. Then we might be getting a bigger release for this movie if they got rights to reenact scenes from those. Well, and therein lies part of the problem. It's like, you know, what studios and, 
you know, who's got what kind of mm-hmm. thing, who's going to be able to, what are they going to be able to even get a hold of? Yeah. So if, if it ends up being that they can only get a few, that's what will happen. They'll only get a few movies because he only has 1,228 <laughs> acting credits to his name. And that was just from last year. Um, <laughs> But, but Nicolas Cage has so many movies, you got to pick and choose what you take from. And if you can only get two, three, four movies, uh, then then you got to go for whatever you can get, I suppose. So, yeah, I'm excited for the movie. This gives me even more jazzed for it to see him uh, take his face off one more time and put the bunny back in the box. So. Put the bunny. Well, um, just to kind of give you an idea, though, I'm just looking at the the the, the company credits for Face Off and Con Air. Mm-hmm. They're both Touchstone. Okay, so that that makes sense as to why they're those two no uh, movie titles were brought up. What the heck was the name of the movie that he's doing? What's it called again? Do you remember? Uh, no, I don't remember what it was called. I'm, or may, I'm not maybe sure. it's because he, maybe he's not listed as actor. Maybe he's listed as self. Nope, that's not it. I was yeah. trying to see if I could find the movie and figure out to uh um yeah, it's not listed on here because he's maybe playing Prisoners his... of the Ghostland. Oh, I'll have to check. I'm not sure. Yeah. Is that it? No. No. Maybe no, it's not no. on IMDb. Yet. Who knows? That's weird. Yeah. So yeah, we'll keep you up. we'll obviously keep you updated. We've we've updated this movie twice already, so mm-hmm. I think I think we're somewhat excited for it. Because it's Nicholas Cage. Nick Cage is Nick Cage. I they love should that just idea. reenact they should take the posters and like replace every other actor in those like Con Air and Face Off just with Nicholas Cage. <laughs> Face off would just be his face, I guess. So, yeah, let's jump to the last it, piece of news either, that we got. Either, here. Olsen, I just had an idea of like the late '90s when it was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone when they were talk basically like riffing Swapping off each other in the movies. And, yeah. Yes, and then so like he'll go and he'll see something and like it would be a Nick Cage movie, but then it will be replaced by a different actor or something like that if he's looking like at the box art or something like that because he wouldn't have made that movie kind of thing because he's playing himself. Maybe who knows. Or just Nicolas Cage is in every movie, then. No. I would, we I would watch we can't that. have that. We, we can have that. <laughs> uh, last piece of news that we got here. Uh, we have another casting update for the Little Shop of Horrors uh, remake that will be coming out shortly. Uh, in talks. This is in talks. These two right here. I am I mean, they're, they come from very credible sources, both of these uh, casting uh, pieces of news here for this film. But Chris Evans is in talk to play... The dentist character that was made famous by Steve Martin in the 80s uh, remake of Little Shop of Horrors. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Scarlett Johansson is in talk to take on the role of Audrey, the love interest of Seymour in the film that will be played by Taron Egerton. Again, all in talks. The, yeah. The only one who's side on the dotted line that is confirmed currently right now is Billy Porter for the voice of Audrey, which I can completely get behind. Yeah, what about these two here? I so when I first came across this, uh, all the headlines are saying Chris Evans, Chris Evans, Chris Evans, Chris Evans, and you mentioned the Scarlett Johansson thing. I'm like, where the hell did that come from? And mm-hmm. I looked through these, and sure as shit, there's Scarlett Johansson in there too. I'm like, well, why isn't Chris Evans and Scarlett Johansson are in talks? Yeah, especially but. two people who've known each other outside of even the MCU. I've brought this up before. I see two longtime friends being able to work into yet another movie together. Yeah, and I mean, Scarlett Johansson is kind of uh, a big actress right now. She only got nominated for two Academy Awards this year. What? Yeah. No. For that same movie? Yeah. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about... Th- so, the Chris Evans one, I can completely see. Uh, it'll be very much like his uh, Scott Pilgrim character. And I picked... Which he, he, he played he, perfectly. He does perfectly. Taron Egerton is Seymour. I can totally get behind mm-hmm. because he can definitely pull off the nerdy. And we know he can sing. Yeah. And the Scarlett Johansson thing has me on on the edge because like you're not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know if I see it because yeah, I, there was in talks of Lady Gaga taking on the role, and when that was being rumored, I'm like, yeah, I can see that one. Lady Gaga can obviously sing, obviously, and just in terms of the Audrey character, she fits that more than I think Scarlett Johansson would. And I haven't seen Scarlett Johansson sing, so I don't. I don't know if she has the chops for that. I mean, I mean, I guess I don't know. Does she sing in that one Coen Brothers movie that? Hail Caesar. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I never saw Hail I don't Caesar. Know if she does. I think I've literally seen like two Coen Brother movies in my entire life. Yeah. I don't know Scarlett. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about Scarlett Johansson here. I guess we we shall see once yeah. it becomes more permanent because this is one of those remakes that I think is had enough time. 
there's enough love for the original, both of them, but I think this is a good way to be able to induce some musicals to a new generation. Yeah. Uh, here comes, I'm going to leave with one question on this film. Let's say this is, this is what happens here. Let's say Scarlett Johansson and Chris Evans are cast in this film. Yes. We get Taron Edgerton as Seymour. I'm okay with this. Who plays the, like, the Bill Murray character that just enjoys being tortured at the dentist? <laughs> Ooh. Originally played by Jack Nicholson. Can we just get Bill Murray to come back? <laughs> to come back and do it? Yeah, I don't know who, who would fit in that right now. Like, why not? Yeah, I my pick my pick. Let it let off. it be like a like it's not a like a remake. It's sort of pseudo pseudo sequel. And it's the, he plays the same guy. Yeah, uh, the only one I just randomly popped in my head. I, Andy Samberg is the name that popped in my head. No, don't ruin it. Don't ruin. I I'm not saying that he's not funny. I, but like you're kind of getting to like a certain. Uh, no. Think of the cast of that that movie though. It was Steve Martin, John Candy, Rick Moranis, uh, Bill Murray. It was all it was those '80s comedians. I uh, think no. if you're bringing in today's, you got to have at least one comedian in the movie. None of these actors are comedic we, actors we, per se. We needed to be more serious. I don't know. I got no, nothing. I got yeah. nothing. Yeah. I think we can think of somebody better than Andy Samberg. I don't know. That's just the first name that popped in my head. Of course it is. You love Brooklyn Nine Nine. I you do. Lo- you love the Lonely Island. I love it all. And uh, Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping is one of the top twenty movies of the decade. So it is proof. Go check out that. <laughs> yeah. Go check out that episode to see where Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping lands on our top twenty list of the decade. Oh, where was that? Oh, there it is. I see it. Okay. It gets pretty high. All right. That is not very high. What? Didn't even break the top ten. It got top. It's what top. It's top fifteen. That's pretty good for freaking pop star. Never stop. Never stopping. I don't. I think it's because most of us can stop laughing to veto you. The fact that I <laughs> that I played pop star. Yeah, still my favorite pick of that show. So, uh, anyway, let's jump to this week's main topic. All right, this is where you're going to get long winded. Long winded. So let's kick it off with Universal monster movies. And that what we're already talking about. That's what we're doing and yeah. we're going to be doing the history of these films and uh, by no stretch of the imagination are we experts on this? You're more of an expert at this point right now than I am. No, how, many, how many of these have true. you watched over the last few weeks? Uh, I will pull I over the last few weeks uh, I reached I rewatched all but one. So in total I've seen 25 of these movies. Uh, so you I watched about... over, I watched over 20 of them in the last month. So about thirty hours worth of monster movies. Yeah, yeah. Because they're not they're, they're not all very about long. An, they're all about an hour. And some are hour fifteen, hour twenty. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that was yeah. That's been my movie watching for the last month. Was these monster movies? Well, let me let me start with this here. You've had opportunity to watch a bunch of Dracula movies. We're talking Dracula, The Invisible Man, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Who is out of overall all of the universal monsters? Who is the overall best out of all of these movies? Good, the bad, the ugly. Overall, like just has the best overall uh, slate of films. Like if someone was to go into and be like, I want to just start with the best character right off the bat. Okay, who should we go for? Yeah, uh, that's. I think it. I lean towards the Wolfman. Right? Can and... you look like one? Because I, I look like one, and uh, Lon Chaney Jr. is my hero. Uh, but yeah, I think that's... The Wolfman is kind of an, an anomaly, though. Because he only gets his solo movie, and then he's in a bunch of spinoffs. He never gets a direct sequel. So he's only in his first movie, where So he literally has just one movie. He literally gets The Wolfman. And then he's in Frankenstein meets The Wolfman, and uh, House of Dracula, and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Like He's in all the spinoff movies, so but he's only wh- in specifically his own movie. So if I were to look at the Wolfman based on that description, the Wolfman's equivalent to the MCU is the Incredible Hulk. In it- more ways than one. <laughs> and you are exactly right. Uh, yeah, the, the the Wolfman, he is their Bruce Banner. He is the character that is given this disease or this, this curse that he does not want. Mm-hmm. And when he's his normal human being, either being Bruce Banner or... Uh, Lawrence Talbot, the Wolfman. They are like the nicest dudes, the, the the sweetest guys. They are people you want to hang out with and people you want to be with. And then when they turn into their monsters, you're like, all right, run away. <laughs> because they will kill anyone in their path. 
and yeah, that's that's this story right here with the Wolfman, and yeah, he is that version of he he is basically he's, the, he's incredible the Incredible Hulk. Hulk. Yeah, uh, and that's one of one of the influences for the Incredible Hulk is the Wolfman along with Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, obviously. What? But yeah, uh, yeah, that's the character that has stuck out to me the most, along with Frankenstein's monster, and we can we'll get into that for sure. I like at least that you know. Granted, yes, you're you're, and I'm also a werewolf guy. Like that's my monster. Period. Yeah. yeah. In terms of vampires and witches and ghosts and goblins and ghouls, I bet you're like, werewolves. I bet you're upset and sad that Monster Squad was not like a Universal movie that you could quantify as part of your watch. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about those type of movies too, because <laughs> I want to talk about that and uh, uh, Young Frankenstein because those are very much like they're Universal monster movies. They're just not. Under the uni- they're not under the Universal banner, but they're like, we're Universal monster movies. So we'll talk about some of those, too. Kevin Bacon. Yeah, uh, the <laughs> Hollow Man. Uh, but yeah, let's start off with back. We're going to go way back. How to, far back? To 1923. How old were you? I was... <laughs> I don't even know how old my grandparents were then, so I don't even know if they were born then. I don't know. Uh, but 1923... My God, man. At least know your family. <laughs> the first official movie in the Universal Monsters series was The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, played by the great Lon Chaney Sr. in the, the role of Quasimoto. Uh, and this is during the silent era. So this is where it kicked off, during the silent era for Universal. So That just goes to show how long Universal's been around. Yeah. Like, of all of these... Movies. And this is just their horror movies. Right. Just yeah. but I mean just in general. I mean, if you look at that, I mean, how many studios are currently in present day that can say that they've been around for a hundred years? A hundred yeah. years. Yeah. What them and what Disney, that's about it. I mean, uh Paramount is pretty old, not as old as these, but yeah, that's that's kind of the two big ones. Uh but yeah, the Universal is literally the house that the monsters built. Yes. Universal that we know and love today. Everything that Universal has made sense, even Ooh. the Universal Parks. Uh, yeah, this is because of these monsters. Um, so yeah, it kicked it off with, with the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, and yeah, Lon Chaney was their guy during this time. So during this time, studios, if they loved an actor, they stuck with him. They were in every movie they made, and they stuck with the same actor in different roles and different uh, actresses to play different love interests, that type of thing back then. And Cheney was known as the man of a thousand faces. And, and be- why would that be? Because of all the characters he could play and he then created, because he also did the makeup for himself. Oh, like sure. He didn't have a makeup artist back then. It was himself. He created all this iconic makeup. And if you look at his hunchback... It's terrifying. Like, the Hunchback is a scary-looking dude. And then, right after that, is one of my favorite ones that was not played in the Killer Countdown because he, he never got any other sequels or a franchise out of it, was The Phantom of the Opera 1925, where The Phantom is also played by Lon Chaney Sr. We've had a few different, like, Phantom films. Yeah, but this is the only... I believe it's the only one straight from Universal, and it's only one that's not a musical either. Oh, that sure. That was also a big thing. It was before the Andrew Lloyd Webber kind of yeah, interaction. Yes. And, yeah, I, I love this film. This is also a silent film from that that same uh, era. and it's launched straight with the cue cards and everything? Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, and then this movie has still one of the greatest monster reveals ever. And it is when they're in the opera area and they're underground, you know, where the Phantom is and he's playing the organ. Mm-hmm. And the main act, the, the main lead, the female lead in the movie is coming down there to see what he looks like. And she comes up and he's playing the organ. And it's just a slow tension building to her unmasking him. Mm-hmm. And when the mask is off, it's like these dead eyes and like the skull looking face from Lon Chaney. And his mouth is just a gape and like his eyes are, oh, it's so, it's so good. It's such a great reveal from this. And. Cheney is like one so, of, Cheney is one of the most underrated actors ever. Period. So what along you're, with this, song. what you're saying is that the, uh, the, the 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 special effects artists of today could really learn from the special effects from yeah and eighty many, years ago. And many of them have. They, uh, I mean, a lot of the great special effects artists like uh, uh, Tom Savini. I and, think of Greg Nicotero. And Nicotero. I'm blanking on the guy's name. He did the the American Werewolf in London makeup. Mm. Uh, Baker. Uh, Clive it? Baker? No, no, no Rick, Rick Baker. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I was like, wait a minute. Wrong Baker. Uh, that's Barker. Clive Barker. Yeah. Hey, you know what? 
Yeah. Uh, Rick Baker, he is a big Universal monster guy. And a lot of these guys, the makeup guys of today in the 80s and the big big movies back then, they look towards these monster movies, and you can definitely see that influence on them. But yeah, then we jump to the 30s. This is uh, a quick, quick segue into that was that the first movie in the 30s was Dracula. This is also the first speaking movie for these monster movies. And Lon Chaney Sr. was the guy that Universal wanted to be Dracula. But did it become Dracula? He did not. He unfortunately passed away from cancer before the movie was ever put into production. There, cancer? Yeah. Therefore, funnily enough, it was he had uh, throat cancer. And, uh, he and was, then he, he couldn't was, be able to do the speaking he, role. He, he wouldn't be able to speak, and he came from the silent era, so... Yeah, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, he never got that chance to. He he did one speaking movie, I guess, in his career. You know, the part that's funny is I just think you're like, you know, all right. If if Dracula is the first movie that Univer- Universal puts out that is the first speaking role, uh, I think Dracula is an interesting first round just because he has that trans that known Transylvanian accent. Yeah, and Universal was looking towards literature at the time. Mm -hmm. Because they took, obviously, Dracula from the Bram Stoker novel. Then later that same year, Frankenstein from the Mary Shelley novel. So they were taking stuff from novels that were very popular during the time. Sure. And then Dracula was also a stage play during this time. And during that time, Bela Lugosi was playing Dracula on the stage and therefore made the transition to film. And probably one of the most famous Draculas we've ever had. Not taken away from a Gary Oldman, but uh No, I and this is still the Dracula people think of. Yeah. Like the, the Transylvanian voice. That right. that is Bell that's just Bella Lugosi's accent. Like that's what people are stealing from. Is that just him talking? Yes, it's, it's just him talking. Is that, okay, that I didn't know. I mean, yeah. I, I'm familiar with the accent. I'm familiar with that, but I... He's, he's kind of enhancing it a little I bit. I was going to say, because I was like, I know he's obviously not in, an American and whatnot, but... I, I believe didn't. he's from hung- Hungary. Well, which would make sense, yeah. because that's kind of where the yeah. Transylvania lore is mm-hmm. supposed to you know, come from in that area. Yeah, and this is the... Yeah, this is still, in many people's eyes, the definitive Dracula, and that's 1931. We're almost 100 years removed from this movie, and it's still sticking around. Every version of Dracula you see on, like, a cereal box or in a cartoon or a commercial, whatever... Count it's Chocula. Th- it's this Dracula. Like, it's this Dracula. Count Chocula is based off Bela Lugosi's Dracula. Like, it's... It's the same character, so yeah, that's kind of where the big boom is starting here with Dracula 1931. Then later that year, <laughs> later, Fra- later that later year, later that same year, what a year! A uh, 1931 Frankenstein comes out, directed by James Whale. Uh, his name will come up quite a bit as we continue talking about these movies. Uh, and yeah, Frankenstein is obviously based on the Mary Shelley novel, and for the time, this movie was really revolutionary. And why was that? Uh, one, for their... One, it was terrifying. It still is terrifying. Uh, two, because of some of the scenes in this movie that were cut out after being released in a few theaters. Uh, one of those, including a very famous line, I know what it feels like to ha- to be God. And the people in the 30s are like, oh my God, that's, blas- that's blasphemy. You can't <laughs> be saying that. You can't be saying that on the screen. Yeah, so they cut that line out. It was later put back in. And then there's a very iconic scene, which even if you haven't seen the movie, you've probably seen the scene. It's where Frankenstein's monster is playing with the, the young girl, and they're picking flowers and throwing them into the water to mm-hmm. watch them float. And then Frankenstein's monster picks up the girl and s- sees if she can float and throws her into the water, and she drowns. So Sad that face. was cut from the movie him throwing her in the water but an, another iconic scene that is still in the movie is the dad carrying the lifeless body of his daughter i'm like that's still scary now mm-hmm. imagine in 1931 how terrifying that would be oh yeah because okay. if you don't really understand the concept of film maybe during that time you think y- this might be real like oh my god this happened right i was gonna say is that you know we they come from a different time where you know storytelling and what is real, what is fake kind of thing. Unless you could, like, legit see them. Like, yeah, that's some bad makeup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think Frankenstein is... It was one of my favorite uh, ones growing up. And one of the few novels that these are based off of that I actually have read as a kid. 
uh, I remember nothing about it now, just that I loved watching yeah, it's it. It's funny is that you you make reference to that, and I have no idea if these are even somewhat connected or inspired by or anything. I don't, but all of a sudden when you made the reference about the little girl in the, the river and everything like that, I immediately thought of, of like of Mice and Men because where it's like he's not meaning to do wrong he just doesn't understand he's too he's he doesn't un, he it's he hasn't got that that grasp of mm-hmm. reality and that's exactly what frankenstein's monster is mm-hmm. uh, where people talk about frankenstein and frankenstein's monster who's 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 the man who's the monster type of thing mm-hmm. very much in this first movie the Doc, monster Dr. is the Frank, doctor. Dr. Frankenstein's the monster. He's a he's a pretty evil dude in this movie. And then the monster himself, played by Boris Karloff, is very sympathetic. Yeah. And even more so in the sequel, and we'll get to that uh, later. But yeah. yeah. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. It's one, the, it's one of the best ones still. I love this but movie. But still your Wolfman's your man. Wolfman is still my man, but I think uh, Frankie is, is not too hard, far behind. Uh, Does Frankie go to Hollywood? Frankie does go to Hollywood, but Brian, just relax. We're moving on to The Mummy. <laughs> Uh, 1932, also played by Boris Karloff in this film. So Karloff is now playing another very uh, famous monster in this movie. And yeah, The Mummy uh, was not based off of any previous literature. This is ba- this is a whole this brand is, new story for them. And this would be more of based off of history probably more than it was literature. Yes, and especially during that time because they were discovering ancient egyptian tombs during yes. the 20s and and 30s and stuff so that's very much what this movie was based off of and yeah played by the great boris karloff getting speaking roles unlike he did with frankenstein's monster right uh he's very he's very good in this movie too just very mesmerizing the way he and and if you ever hear boris karloff speak he has this very deep voice like just this deep <laughs> menacing voice i love it uh, yeah, then the next uh, next film we have right after that, the next year, The Invisible Man, also directed by James Whale, based off a, um, a Wells novel of, of, what, the late 1800s, right in there, H.G. Wells, early 1900s, I believe. Maybe. Yeah, uh, this movie is uh, w- w- far ahead of its time, as many James Whale movies are, uh, and The Invisible Man obviously follows a mad scientist who has discovered the ability to become invisible, and what this movie is really known for is its transcendent special effects, well, and considering the fact it that still works to this day. You're making a lot of uh, people that aren't really there, you know, and I mean, that's, you pretty much look at, you know, what we what we do today is pretty much all CGI you know the fake you're not the fake footprints but you know like footprints in the sand or something like that you know they 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 didn't have that back then to be able to pull off the feats of an invisible person without the what would be like a wire or you know you know what we would do put in like a post that's what they're doing now is still they were still doing the wire stuff Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that but then they would also when when it comes to the great another great monster reveal is in this movie where the invisible man, he's wearing all his iconic bandages mm-hmm. and the goggles. And uh, there's a great scene where basically the the invisible man's an asshole in this movie, period. Just throughout the movie, he's just an asshole. And it's I, so funny. I think the only invisible man that's never been an asshole is, um, is Chevy Chase. No, I mean, in all the sequels, they're all pretty pretty sympathetic. This guy is not. He's just a jerk. Like I, I'm like, I hate you, but I, I love watching you type of character. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a great reveal where the, the police are coming after him because they're trying to kick him, kick him out of this hotel that he's staying in. And he r- literally rips off his fake nose and th- throws it at the cops and then starts peeling the bandages off. And you just see that there's nothing there. And you're like, oh my, like, how does that happen? And just a great use of special effects of the time and, and how they reveal that. So, yeah, The Invisible Man, way ahead of its time, directed by James Whale. Uh, he followed it up two years later with his sequel to Frankenstein with The Bride of Frankenstein. I just out of curiosity. I'm just throwing this out here. We're not even out of the 30s. How long are we? Uh, are we gonna go through it? No, we won't, we, we got to hit the iconic ones. Okay, here at the okay. Now I, I, okay, I was just trying to understand where you were going. We'll we'll speed it up once we get <laughs> get past these next like two. We'll we'll speed it up a little bit. Uh, but yeah, Bri- we have to talk about Bride of Frankenstein because in many ways this is still the greatest Universal monster film of all time. Greatest love story? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not at all. Uh, it is. It takes what. He did in the first film and enhances it tenfold. 
Uh, the story of Dr. Frankenstein, the monster, the bride. They introduce a new mad scientist, Dr. Pretorius. Uh, yeah, and again with James Whale, he is transcending the genre and transcending filmmaking at the time. Because James Whale was an openly, openly gay man during mm-hmm. this time, which is very... Especially that time. During that time, that was a big kind of... Uh, like a taboo thing or like a thing people just didn't want to talk about or, or mm-hmm. discuss. And he, he was an open, openly gay man and many times in his films he's expressing some of his worldviews in them and maybe most present here in Bride of Frankenstein where he treats Frankenstein's monster almost as like in many times he's a Jesus Christ figure, he's a child, he's uh, he he's just a, a, a like a layman. He's just like he's he's this creature that's constantly learning and trying to adapt and uh, understand the world around him. And then we introduce, of course, the bride, the iconic bride, at the end of the film. And yeah, it's just an iconic look for the the character. She's not in the movie very much, so. But yeah, it's all about Frankenstein's monster in this movie. And I, I even I, though I it's love the bride the, of the character of it. Yeah, it's the bride. It's the 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 bride is the plot of the film. She's not the character of the film. Well, and I I remember I even asking you. I'm like, okay, so I know that it's Frankenstein's monster. It's not Frankenstein isn't the monster per se. Um, but then I was asking him like, well, if it's the bride of Frankenstein, I was like, is it the bride of the monster or the bride of the doctor? Because you have to admit, if one understands what. Frankenstein is 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 the doctor and whatnot. That title is semi misleading. Yeah, it's it's more to say it's more to just have the Frankenstein name in there, right? Which I, I I yeah. get that too, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, because you're not gonna be like the bride of the monster. At this point, where people are like, well, what's who's Frank? Well, Frankenstein's the the green guy with the bolts in his head. I'm like, well, no, Frankenstein's no. the doctor. But at this point, I'm like. Either one, I don't care. Frankenstein's the the green dude with the bolts, or he's the doctor. He's both. I don't care. I no. I need it's, I it's need fine. consistency. Th- these movies don't have consistency <laughs> with it. And they they call Frankenstein Frankenstein Frankenstein's monster Frankenstein a couple of times. So they they kind of lose that later in the sequel. So even they're like, whatever. <laughs> We're just making movies. Give us yeah. a break, man. But yeah, if you guys haven't seen, Bri- I think Bride of Franken. This is where the 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 must sees. Are these films um, *Bride*, *Invisible Man*, *Mummy*, *Frankenstein*, *Dracula*, *Phantom of the Opera*? All must-see movies that are during this time. Uh, and then we kind of run into some other spin-off type of films. Uh, *Werewolf of London* is in 1935, uh, and then *Dracula's Daughter*, the sequel to *Dracula*, uh, 1936. And that's kind of the end of the first era of monster movies. And then the Universal kind of took a little bit of a break, and they came back with *Son of Frankenstein* which follows the same mythos of the first two Frankenstein movies. Uh, but it also brings Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi into the film together. Dun, dun, dun. Because this is where we get the famous Igor, mm. which is not present in the first two movies. Uh, this time he is played by Bela Lugosi. Mm-hmm. And Frankenstein's monster, again, is played by Boris Karloff. So, yeah, those are two of the big names during this time. Uh, yeah, then we run into, we get some more sequels, Invisible Man Returns, Mummy's Hand, Invisible Woman. Then, 1941, we get, uh, one of our last two big introductions into the monster universe with the Wolfman. The Wolfman? The Wolfman. Your, your, your favoritest man of the, the Universal My Monsters. Your favoritest man of all, the Wolfman, played by the great Lon Chaney Jr., uh, very much inheriting what his father presented during the 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 teens and the twenties, uh, and yeah, this uh, this is my favorite Universal monster movie here, The Wolfman, uh, and Cheney is fantastic, and every time he he puts on the wolf makeup and every time he's playing Lawrence Talbot, it's he, he's just transcendent in those roles, and he's so great as as that character. So, yeah, that's my favorite, The Wolf The Wolfman. I see the resemblance of me and the Wolfman. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's always he's always, ever since I was a kid. I'm like, oh yeah, that's my boy. That's your man. That's my boy right there, the Wolfman. Yeah, this... so Monster Squad did make you sad. No, no, no. I like Monster Squad because <laughs> then we get the most famous line of that. That's movie. what made me think. Wolfman's got nards, baby. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Then we jump into we get a, quite a few sequels here: The Ghost of Frankenstein, Invisible Agent, Mummy's Tomb. Then we get our first monster mash. 
Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. <laughs> Thor meets our Hulk. Yeah, so Frankenstein's monster meets the Wolfman is what I guess this should be called. But yeah, this is the first Monster Mash movie uh, of that time. And then we later get that again with the house movies, as they're called. The House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula. Uh, yeah, so yeah, these are our big Monster Mash movies where... Obviously, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. It's just Frankenstein, Wolfman. But when we get to the house movies, it's the three big boys. Sure. Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman. Are they all going against each other? Are they teaming up so, against some other bad guys? So in House of Frankenstein, it is about uh, two escaped uh, prisoners. Uh, one of them is a scientist. One of them is, is his hunchback sidekick as all of these movies have the they, they kind of if they they stick with the trope they kind of stick with it throughout the series uh but yeah house of frankenstein they escape they find dracula's uh, uh remains uh, they remove the dagger from him bringing back dracula to life dracula's kind of a bitch in this movie uh he, <laughs> he's kind of a slave to to these two scientists and then dracula dies 20 minutes in uh, and then we get, but it, but it was enough for them. Like, hey, but we got Dracula. But Dracula's in it. Dracula's in it. If you want to go see this movie in the theater for ten cents, yeah. And then we get to Frankenstein's monster and the Wolfman. So that one doesn't have them all in the same scenes together, until we get to House of Dracula, where I think it's the far superior of the two monster mash movies, mm-hmm. because House of Dracula is Dracula and the Wolfman are both trying to seek cures for their afflictions. Sure. Dracula doesn't want to be a vampire. Wolfman doesn't want to be a werewolf. So they and, are seeking and the Fra- out. And Frankenstein just doesn't want to be a monster? Frankenstein comes in later. They go and, and search of Frankenstein's monster to try to find a cure and f- find a, way of, a new way of life. It's mm. basically taking what the doctor was trying to do. I don't know. It's convoluted. <laughs> uh, what? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, then, but that one we actually do get the Wolfman, Dracula, and Frankenstein in the same scene, and they're all there together. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Unfortunately, the only one that's played by the original actor is Lon Chaney. So we never actually get to ever see Lon Chaney Jr., Bella Lugosi, or Boris Karloff all in the same film. And that makes you so, sad. That makes me sad. I wish they all could have played their iconic characters in the same movie together. They all get to reprise them in, in different ways. But yeah, and all of them get to play different monsters. Lugosi gets to play Dracula. He gets to play Igor. He plays um, Frankenstein's monster. So he gets to play three of them. Karloff gets to play Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, uh, the mad scientist. Uh, and then Lon Chaney Jr. gets to play pretty much everyone. He gets to play the mummy, the wolfman, Frankenstein's monster, and Dracula. So he gets to run the gambits on all of them. Boy, it's almost like the the, 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 the Disney Marvel trifecta thing. Like, I'm going to be in a Marvel movie. I'm going to be in a Star Wars movie. I'm going to be in a Disney movie. <laughs> And that was studios at the time. They, if they liked one guy, yeah, you just he's in the next thing. Yeah. Exactly, mm-hmm. he's he's the the Donald Glover of the Disney you know trope right now. Yeah, well, Donald Glover's the Lon Chaney of now. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So yeah, then we're running into all the sequels here, and then once we get past all the ho- the house movies where they all team up, this is where we go to the comedy route with the. Abbott and Costello meet trilogy where they get to meet the Frankenstein's monster. They meet the Invisible Man and they meet Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. So this is where it becomes more of a comedic route during this time because this is it. This is post-World War II. People are ready for lighthearted fare. They're, they're just they're kind ready of, to be a little bit, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not really scared of these monsters anymore. They've seen them. Uh, at this point, maybe it's like their parents were scared of them. Now the kids are like, yeah, monsters. Those are cool. Yeah, we, we, we saw those monsters when we were little. Yeah, so now they're ready to to bring them into the comedic route. And they go this route with, with yeah, all the monsters get a show. This, again, another monster mash. Uh, this is the closest we get to having Lugosi and Chaney and everyone together in Bella Le- and uh, uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Because Lugosi mm-hmm. comes back as Dracula. For the first time since 1931. Oh, jeez. Uh, Chaney is back as the Wolfman, but Glenn Strange is in the Frankenstein monster role, which he's probably the second most famous actor to put on the makeup. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they, they definitely go in the more comedic route with all these films. And then they go back into the horror with 1954's Creature from the Black Lagoon. The Black Lagoon? Yes, Creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, bringing the monsters back to prominence, making them scary once again. Uh, and yeah, this follows a group of, of um, 
they're what what what's the term I'm looking for? Like deep, they're like deep sea divers and and uh, like people on expeditions. They're looking for fossils and um, yeah, they're trying to find the the full remains of this this hand this bone hand that they have found that has never been seen before, and they're trying to find the rest of it. And they sure do find the rest of it. And with, he attacks them. And he attacks them. Uh, so yeah, this movie again. Uh, for its time, way ahead of its time uh, for 1954. Uh, all the underwater stuff is fantastic. I don't know why James Cameron is like, I don't know how to do under- underwater. I'm like, just go watch Creature from the Black Lagoon. Because I get it's a different... Uh, it's just well, I it's a joke. Say, it's I, a joke. No, but. I was just going to say, as he's like, I can't do CGI in... Uh, you know, he can't... Oh, rephrase. He can't do practical effects I'm like, just do in the water. <laughs> But they did back no, then. No. That's the crazy thing. But he lives in his CGI world. Yeah, yeah. Just go watch this movie, J- Jimmy Cameron. Come on. Uh, but yeah, the creature effects are fantastic. Again, the one thing I constantly question in this movie is like, throughout the movie, there's divers going underwater and they have the bre- the scuba breathing apparatuses. Mm-hmm. And, but then you cut to the creature and he's just swimming. I'm like, how is the stunt guy breathing? A I'm lot. like, are you just holding your breath a lot or what? Like, I, that's the the biggest question. I still want to. Have you out never watched movies. any like behind the scenes for stuff like that and whatnot? For for creature, I have not. So that's well, the one I need to go into. Just typically any movie like that, that I've seen with the behind the scenes of you know the makings of and stuff like that is you'll find a lot of those scenes that they're short takes with a cut and you know a change of camera and stuff like that. Because they're literally down there for like 30, 60 seconds or whatnot, doing their thing and whatnot, and immediately cut and go to the guy that's literally next over there with the scuba gear with the thing so they can breathe. That's the thing. They can't with the mask on. The mouth doesn't open underwater. Mm -hmm. The mouth is stuck there. So to take that entire thing off, I think that would take quite a bit. So this guy has to be holding his breath for minutes. No, I think it's a matter of cut, go up, get some breathe some air, come down, do it again. So, if have you seen Creature from the Black Lagoon? No. Some of these scenes are pretty long where he's underwater. Perspective. Like, like he's pretty long. On, no, like it's all one take where he's underwater for some. And of see, these. that just is. I and I, he's fighting people underwater too. I'm like, yeah, that's I don't know. So yeah, that's one of the things. And I uh, during the time they weren't movie as movie magic. It is movie magic, and I still I'm wondering. That's why I like movies so much. I'm still constantly questioning. How how'd you do this? <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, like no. Well, the, even during the time, I'm not sure how they did this. It could uh, that's because yes, I know. Like obviously, underwater scenes, you have a scuba guy off to the side out of the shot, and then he comes in quick and put that in, put the scuba gear in your mouth. But I'm like. Yeah, this mask doesn't open, and I'm like, he's under there for a long time, and he probably has a thing like in the back of his head. They just kind of hook up the hose to him. <laughs> All right, breathe. Hey, you never know. Yeah, but this movie again, way ahead of its time with the creature effects, the the underwater effects, and then uh, the main actress in the film, very famous now, Julie Adams. She's just gorgeous in this movie. <laughs> She is. She's just. She's stunning of all of of this, and definitely one of the reasons why this movie is, is stuck around for so long. And yeah, that was kind of the end of the original series was with the creature from the Black Lagoon. uh, And he gets two more sequels with Revenge and The Creature Walks Among Us. So that was kind of the end of this, the original cycle of these movies kind of ended there in the 50s. And look how long it took for Universal to dive back into the pool. Yeah, it did take them a while. They did do a remake of Dracula in 1979. But... It came back full force with 1999's The Mummy, directed by Stephen Summers. Uh, definitely the name that has helped revitalize the monster movies and the monster characters in pop culture. And who would have thought the the revitalization of the Marvel or Marvel of the Universal monsters belongs to Brendan Fraser, the guy from Airheads. <laughs> Amongst other things. Encino Man. Encino Man. Oh yeah. my god, I need to rewatch that. <laughs> we're going to do a Pauly Shore episode. I don't know well. I don't care. I'm we're gonna, com- we're I'm, compl- do I'm completely okay with that, we're actually. We're going to do it. There uh, is enough Pauly Shore movies <laughs> that I enjoy that I'm okay with that. Yeah. Well, look out uh, for our Pauly Shore episode coming up. But 1999's <laughs> The Mummy. This was the... I think... I don't remember which one I, exactly I watched first. I know it was during this time, 1999, 2000, mm-hmm. when I watched these movies. Because I know for sure as a kid I watched the first two mummies 
quite a bit. And then I watched Wolfman and Frankenstein during that time. That was kind of the two that I watched. Uh, but yeah, this is one that was on repeat at my house, though. The Mummy. The Mummy? Yeah. It was because it was genuinely good. Like, it was... The the, the, the the Mummy villain was very well done. You know, you definitely had your heroine uh, and your hero and everything like that amongst everything. Um, it's just that, I mean, for modern day a monster movie, there really isn't anything in the late 90s to even come anywhere close to that. Uh, hot take, this is the best Mummy movie, period. You're not wrong. No, it even with the original movies, and I know people people do love those, and I really enjoyed uh, quite a few of them, uh, even a lot of the sequels from the original series. But yeah, I definitely think this is the best of those Mummy movies. It has a compelling hero, compelling side characters, also a scary villain. Uh, even the special effects I was gonna say the are special still, are still pretty good. The, I mean, there's a few instances that you can definitely tell it. it certain things have not aged well, uh, but I mean, if you look at what its you know source material is, I think it's done very well. Um, the CGI was good for what is 1999. Mm-hmm. Let's disregard the Scorpion King, but that's a different thing. Yeah, that's the, that's the sequel, and I think that <laughs> kind of gets lumped into this where people are like, oh, the Rock CGI though. I'm like. But that's the sequel. Yeah. This but, no no. Yeah, the the think... CGI that's done for uh the mummy, the man himself, mm-hmm. like when he gets that really big long jaw, like it holds well. Yeah, it does. And uh the most iconic scene for me is where the beetles are crawling underneath the skin. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Yep, that scared me as a kid. I still kind of get like gives you a little bit of gives now. you the heebie jeebies. Yeah, yeah I, I still think it's a very effective use of, of CGI and yeah, and overall, this has just a great tone to it. It's very fun. It's very lighthearted. It has some kind of creepy, some heebie-jeebie moments, like you said. Uh, and then I think the, the the set direction and stuff is is very good. Like it reminds me of these old school Universal monster movies. Mm-hmm. And also, it's set during those times, so that also helps very much too. Yeah, and, and you know, Universal's like, "Yep, the Mummy did really good. Let's bring the Mummy Returns." Yes, and let's bring in. <coughs> The Rock. So this is where the, the Rock shows up as the Scorpion King. I don't remember much about this movie besides the the Rock during it and the very bad CGI. And the very bad CGI. I um, did see a. Yeah. I forget the name of the company. It's, they have a YouTube channel and they actually went through and like took from sources and different things for the Rock and everything like that. And like, there's like five guys. They specialize in certain things in CGI. Oh, that scene looks so much better. Like the part where the the rock comes in as the Scorpion King and whatnot. Like they redid that entire scene. I'm like, can we just hire these guys to redo the movie? Let's just get a special edition for the Mummy trilogy. Exactly. I'd I'd be all for it. Why not? And then we get uh, Stephen Summers is still... That was Universal's guy there for a while. Uh, Because then he does in 2004 Van Helsing with Hugh Jackman, Kate Beckinsale. uh, Very much another monster mash type of film. Uh, where we follow Van Helsing, the anti-hero of sorts in this movie, mm-hmm. as he's fighting Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, the Wolfman. Uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde is in this movie, right? I don't remember. I don't, I don't, I don't remember a, look. a whole lot about this um, I will. I will say this. Is it? Is it critically loved all the time? Absolutely not. But at, you know, at the same time, too, I enjoyed it. You know, this was what like the first thing that Hugh Jackman did that was that was mainstream that was not Wolverine yeah yeah you know and you know I enjoyed Kate Beckinsale I love her in the underworld films and whatnot you know it was a good nice to see something mm-hmm. a different change of pace and whatnot well she's kind of the same character a little bit yeah um but overall like I I thoroughly enjoyed you know this movie it's again it's not top notch but you know i kind of lumped this in the same kind of idea of like what like the universal fast and furious movies are they're popcorn movies you're not going to go to this movie for it to be perfect or anything like that it's doing it's doing exactly what these these movies do yeah this movie's terrible uh uh, it has a really good opening 15 minutes where it's actually all shot in black and white and we're in uh frankenstein's castle and dracula shows up and he's kind of manipulating dr frankenstein like yeah, I'm kind of into this, and it's shot in black and white, and it does the iconic windmill uh, ending, mm-hmm. and I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of into this movie, and then the actual plot kicks, and I'm like, oh, no, <clears throat> and then, yeah, uh, Hugh Jackman is kind of phoning it in, Kate Beckinsale is, she's fine, 
for for what what, what the role she always plays in these movies. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I I don't like Van Helsing very much. Uh, the one thing I will give it, along with the two mummies right before this, mm-hmm. is it brought the Universal monster movies back. Like right. that was, I think that's why I still applaud this movie for being made. For one, is that yeah, now people are like. We can go discover the original Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman and the Mummy. Like we can discover all this stuff over mm-hmm. again. So I'll give it. I'll definitely give it props for that. Van Helsing did make over three hundred million worldwide. Yeah, it, it was. It was a big money maker. It and, also cost him one hundred sixty, but but still, it made some money, and there was long talks about a sequel. Mm-hmm. I think even up until a few years ago. Yeah, <laughs> like right. Even I and, think up until Dark Universe. They were still talking about a Van Helsing and sequel. I think that if they would have done it right, like taking the stuff, the criticisms they got from Van Helsing, if they would have actually greenlit and gone for a sequel, I think they could have actually pulled it off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> I think the this movie often reminds me of Blade 3 because it's very much a similar tone, very similar thing where they're getting monster hunters to fight vampires and stuff. Hey, awesome. don't you be knocking Ryan Reynolds going up against Triple H. Yeah, well, Blade, th- <laughs> Blade 3 is worse than this movie. Blade 3 is terrible, too. Uh, yeah, Blade 3, that's a different episode. That's a topic <laughs> for a different day. That's a day for our vampires. Yeah, so yeah, then we'll jump into uh, one lot. We had one more remake during this time of the mid to late 2000s with the Wolfman Joe Johnston uh, film Benicio Del Toro. Yeah, I've never actually seen this Wolfman. I've heard mixed things, but I've heard it's definitely better than some of the other mm-hmm. remakes of this time and ones that have come after as well. You know, I I, I look at the the cast and whatnot, like seeing like ben, Benicio del Toro, like I think has like the look, the feel of like what the Wolfman would be. So I think, I think casting for Benicio Del Toro, I think was a very good solid choice for this. But like you said, I've never seen it either. So I can't say much about the film itself. Like yeah. it, it there wasn't for me enough draw to want to go see it. And it's got some yeah. Academy Award winning actors in it. Yeah. The, the image that you have pulled up right there of the Wolfman looks great. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe it is Rick Baker is doing the makeup effects for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I kind of want to want go see the, seek this movie out and go finally watch it. I mean, I like, I like most of Joe Johnston's movies. Uh, of course, like I said, the Wolfman's my boy. Rick Baker won an Academy Award for this film. I think the, just from that one still image, I think it looks great. So I mm-hmm. might have to jump back and go ahead and watch it. Might give this. it a shot yeah. just for the, I mean, yeah, I mean, think, and he think... looks like the, an updated version of the Wolfman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. I'll go uh, check that out at some point. But this is where we get into the dark universe area. <laughs> the dark uh, universe. The universe we try not to talk about. The one no one wants to discuss. It's the elephant in the room. It's the monster <laughs> in the room. Uh, yeah, they, they tried to kick it off back in 2014. The mummy wasn't the original plan, guys. It was Dracula untold. Dracula not being Dracula, played by Luke Evans. Uh, yeah, Dracula Untold, played by uh, Dracula, obviously, like you said, Luke Evans. He's good in this movie. I think he's a pretty good choice to be Dracula. I haven't found a movie that he's done that I've like. I dislike. Yeah, yeah. Like he's a generally a good, solid dude to have in your movie. Yeah, this Fast is and Furious. This Sorry. was my first uh, Universal monster movie in the theater. I was excited to watch this movie. I haven't seen it since it came out, what, October of 2014? I haven't watched it since then. Uh, so it's been a while, but I liked this movie from what I remember of it. Mm-hmm. I really liked it because it kind of goes back to, it doesn't ne- it doesn't deal with the Bram Stoker novel. It is... Like the, the man before the, the yes, Dracula. Yes, it's Vlad the Impaler Dracula. Like, mm-hmm. and it, it shows quite a bit of that of what you could show for a PG-13 movie. Uh, there's no people hanging on wooden stakes outside of his castle or anything like that. Do you think this would be the kind of thing that if Universal would just be like, you know what, we need to make these movies rated R because we need to be able to have the creative license we need to make these movies the justifiable movies they need to be, that maybe Dracula Untold would have been a better start to the Dark Universe had it been rated R so they didn't have to worry about that? Yeah, I think, again, it's an, a number of things that factor into it. I think it would have benefited 
from a rated R movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, this was during 2014, though, where studios are still afraid of rated R movies. For sure. We hadn't had the big hits like It and Deadpool. That were like, right. Yeah, we can make a ton of money off a rated R movie. Because I don't think even like the big like rated R comedies were even really hitting yet. No, well, The Hangover I mean, was, but it was it, it was that, a comedy though. That, a very right. different thing. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I think that is definitely part of it. Uh, I know a lot of the backlash is, well, he's not scary. I'm like, but how how can you find Dracula scary anymore? I don't know. That's my toughest mm-hmm. thing going forward, and we'll discuss. How do you make him scary again? I'm not scared of Dracula. No, no. Like if you're gonna do it, go like the the old school route where he's Vlad the Impaler and make it kind of a war epic film. And... Which they tried, and obviously that didn't go very far. No, it didn't. And then we you, get to... you would you would almost need to do Dracula to the point where, like, you you don't see him much, and he's more of the shadows, and like he just kind of comes and goes quickly, and very you know just you get to see the aftermath that is dracula yeah and i haven't watched the because uh we have obviously gotten other versions of dracula in the hundreds of years that he's been around Mm -hmm. um i haven't watched the new netflix series i'm kind of excited to watch it i heard it's pretty good which one is it's a brand new netflix a couple episodes mini series on dracula yeah i heard it's pretty good but uh anyway back to the universal monsters and then we get 2017's the mummy we get to reboot the reboot series yes so this is where they finally announced yes we are actually doing a universe this time and this is who we have we have the mummy we have uh, the invisible man bride of frankenstein well if i remember correctly they didn't really announce the dark universe after until like it was right, right around right, the re- release. Release, of this exactly, because that's when they're like, oh, by the way, Johnny Depp is the Invisible Man. Javier Bardem was going to be Frankenstein's monster, I believe. Yeah. By then, we already knew that uh, Russell Crowe was the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde character. You know, and it's just like. Tom Cruise was. Tom Cruise uh, was. Tom, Tom Cruise. Cruise. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, The Mummy. Have you watched this movie? Uh, no. Yeah, it don't. <laughs> it's it's not great. I mean... It's, uh, it's a cruise movie trying to be a monster movie. Many people have called this uh, Mummy Impossible, and it's it's, <laughs> it's definitely under that. Just for the sake of calling it Mummy Impossible makes me want to watch it more. I, but it's not as good as those movies, though, either. This is like Mission Impossible. I don't, it's not good. It's not as good as any of them. So but. we need to reboot the series again. Bring back Tom Cruise. Nope. The, the Mummy Two, directed by J.J. Abrams. Nope. So we can fix the fix the glitch, well, like I you mean, did for if like you're Mission do it, Impossible. Christopher McQuarrie should be the guy that does it. But yeah, this movie's not great. Uh, it again, it take it's taking more from the Brendan Fraser movies than it is the original mm-hmm. Mummy films. Uh, so if you do like the Brendan Fraser movies, you might get some enjoyment out of this one, but. Man, Tom Cruise is he's in a completely different movie than everyone else like uh from from everything I've heard about behind the scenes and stuff, this movie is written, directed, produced and stars Tom Cruise. Uh this is very much a Tom Cruise production. He was very much behind everything about the making of this movie. So, uh, here's a question yeah. I have for you here. I'm a I'm a big fan of Sofia Botella. What would you say she would you would you call her a a suitable foe as being the mummy in this movie? Was she was it a, was it weak? Because you know there's other things that she's done, you know, and this is one of the things that she is absolutely known for. Like this is what helped kind of help break her out a little bit. She's the best part of this movie. Good. See, and that Period. that that would be another reason why I'd be willing to subjugate myself to this. Because I want to see it for her performance. She's well. She's not given a lot to do though either. Okay, is my problem. It's Tom Cruise. It's the Tom Cruise show. It's baby. the Tom Cruise show movie with yeah. with the mummy in the background. The mummy's in the back, uh, and Tom Cruise. There's he's the one there, driving the car. There's now an iconic line from this movie where Russell Crowe, who plays Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, uh, is like showing he's kind of the Nick Fury of this universe, and he's showing it was Tom, Tom Cruise. Uh, it's 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 not over yet. They are still talking about. It's over, but it's uh, over. Uh, but Even he, they... he, he's showing Tom Cruise's character around, and he calls him young man at one point. And I'm like, Tom Cruise is like almost sixty years old. He's he's older than you, Russell Crowe. Why are you calling him young man? Yeah, but we don't know per se how old the Doctor Jekyll is. Yeah, but. Even in real life, I'm like, Tom Cruise, you're a tool. Like, cause that's a line <laughs> he put in the movie. Yeah, because he's, he's Tom Cruise, mid-50s. He's hanging around with 27-year-old actresses. Like, come on, dude. 
Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, this movie's not great. Uh, there's many things, of course, that went wrong with it uh, in their development of the Dark Universe. God, I want to watch this now all of a sudden. Uh, go <laughs> go watch the originals before this. <laughs> and then that will lead us to this upcoming weekend's with uh, The Invisible Man is coming out this weekend, February 28th, directed and written by Lee Wanell. Uh, who is known for creating two of the best uh, modern-day horror franchises in the Insidious franchise and the Saw franchise. Yeah, and, you know, did a fantastic job with Upgrade, you know. And this was one of those ones, and when I heard that Lee Winnell was attached to write and direct, I'm like, you have my money. Like, I have full faith in he is the type of person that is going to put the the love and dedication into making a movie that I think is well-deserved. And the previews, I think, have made it look very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the previews definitely take that original source material of the the Invisible Man and definitely update it for a modern audience. And I, th I, I'm, I'm hoping for the best for this movie. I was hoping for the best for all of these movies when with the the Mummy and Dracula Untold. I was very excited for the Mummy. I don't know why. I was just excited about a dark universe. But, but uh, there was a note there. Blake is actually chiming in on Slack, and that. Uh, looks like that that he thinks that it's going to do very well uh, to probably based on the sneak peeks and it's kind of the the stuff that's kind of going around and whatnot. But we should know here shortly once the uh, the embargo lifts. Yeah, and that's pro but yeah, by the time that this episode drops, it'll be out. The the embargo will lift because yeah, yes, they had. I would assume they had the premiere this past weekend. Probably, but uh, yeah, critics have already seen this movie, so. And from what I've heard from the few things that they could say, you know, I've been hearing good stuff so mm -hmm. far. But yeah, I'm excited for it. This is this is where I want to see the future of these movies go. Get creator-driven stuff. Get guys like Lee Winnell and what? James Wan uh, behind the camera. I was going to say is what if, like, we had, like, Lee Winnell and James Wan and whatnot kind of be the, the, the Feige's of the dark universe. I don't want a dark universe anymore. I'm done with the dark no, universe. No, 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 not... I would I would talk in, in that like if they're gonna make the monster movies or whatever, you know they're kind of let them be the ones that are spearheading it, but maybe do it more of the the correct DCEU right where that there's references to, but they are their own individual movies. Get what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't. I just don't want James Wan and Lee Winnell to be pigeonholed by this, and they're stuck in the dark universe or monster universe, whatever they want what, to call you mean, it. <laughs> dude, they've been making while. horror movies. <laughs> yeah, but each one, they, they get a go. They created Saw, and they did their thing for a little while, and then they're like, "All right, we're gonna go do Insidious, and then we're gonna split off." And well, and that's what I'm saying. James is, is doing Conjuring and Aquaman, and Lee is doing uh, upgrade. upgrade and now Invisible Man. So well, I, I just want I want more directors to come in. No, and I'm, take no over I'm okay monster. with the directors part of it. I'm just thinking is that you need you need a Feige role. You need somebody to kind of oversee everything who understands, like like a Wheatley Winnell or somebody like James Wan that will be able to kind of help keep the ship in the right direction. All I want out of these movies, I want good standalone stories. Yeah. And then if later on you want to cross them over, cross them over yeah. then. But do, that, don't that, don't go in with, hey, we're going to have this movie, this movie, this movie, this movie, then the Monster Squad. Like, <laughs> you know, right. I don't I don't need that. Naturally build them. If if Invisible Man does does good this weekend and makes makes money and it's open for a, a sequel let lee do the sequel and we'll go from there type of mm -hmm. thing but yeah we have other stuff in the works as well and we've talked about this in previous episode uh episodes but uh the dark army is is scheduled to be the next one after the invisible man courtesy of paul fight or uh, paul, paul, paul feig paul feig known paul feig. for uh bridesmaids and the ghostbusters remake I'm not sure about this movie yet. He has mentioned, I guess, uh, the Dark Universe a couple times in his talking of the Dark Army. I don't know what the Dark Army is or what it's going to be. Who knows? Um, but yeah, we are also... But he's also the same guy that, you know, kind of threw people off to loop and did, you know, a simple uh, favor with Blake Lively and Anna Kendrick. So, I mean, he can... And then he followed it up with Last Christmas, so... I was trying to ignore that but that's <laughs> beside the point i'm just saying is that he maybe this is this is paul feig's way of saying you know what i want to try something a little bit different you know and hey i want to 
why why not give the guy an, uh, the option to be able to hey I want to make it a horror movie. Oh yeah, I definitely want to give the guy a chance. I think he can he can do it. I would like to see a cl- like an old school classic monster movie from him. I think mm-hmm. he could pull that off. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we're also in talks for a Renfield movie um, directed by Dexter Fletcher, who did last did Rocket Man this past year. Um, yeah, this is the the the, the spin off of Dracula following. The side character, maybe his point of view from the story. So maybe that's how you fit in Dracula into the story. This he's is, not the main character. It's Renfield. Also being written by Robert Kirkman of The Walking Dead. Yeah. So a man who knows how to drive character-driven horror. Well, sort of. Don't look. I'm talking the comics. Mm-hmm. I'm talking oh, the comics. Okay. I'm not okay. talking the show. <laughs> the show. Uh, the first season's good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, then The Invisible Woman. Elizabeth Banks is set to direct and star in the film. Uh, after watching the ori- the original Invisible Woman, I'm like, yep, this is an Elizabeth Banks movie <laughs> waiting to happen, and obviously we're getting it now. So yeah, that's that's coming up. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm necessarily excited for it, but I think it'll be a pretty similar tone to that original one, which is a straight comedy. I think that'll probably be the route of this one. So next I'm seeing up on the list is we got Monster Mash. So based on like how you're saying is that maybe doing Monster Mash is a little too soon. Depends on like the, there isn't a, there isn't enough in the reboot canon basically to justify doing a monster mash. I this is where I'm wondering what their their plan is because I'm assuming with this monster mash, which I've heard is a musical as well, it won't include Lee Winnell's Invisible Man or Dracula or Frankenstein like a scary version. This will probably be more of a comedic route. This would be more of the Paul Feig type of. Like, comedy slash just a straight i think it'll be a straight comedy type of film yeah again it's like it, you have all these monster characters and their iconic looks just take that and build a movie around it don't mm-hmm. take a universe just make a movie out of what you got yeah so i if they're gonna go that route i'm, I'm all for this monster mash movie i guess we'll see again directed by the the guy who was behind grave encounters which is a great found footage horror film so I'll, i i would like to see that that's pretty cool that he's getting a universal film. So, uh, yeah, Bride of Frankenstein is still on the docket. Uh, Amy Pascal is producing the film. Uh, David Cope is set to be the one. Is he what writing it, directing mm-hmm. it? Uh, looks like he is. Yeah. Uh, no, just writing. Director looks as TBA. Yeah. So he. Yeah, he's done quite a few stuff. He's written. Uh, a, a lot of films. He was one of the writers on Jurassic Park, uh, yeah. the original Spider-Man from 2002. So I'm, yeah, he's done a lot of movies. He's also attached to uh, the Mummy 2017. <laughs> well, you know it's funny too is like you know how like if you're on Wikipedia, you just roll over a link, it gives you that little blurb and whatnot. The ninth most successful screenwriter of all time with box office of 2.3 billion dollars. But many of those films he co-wrote with other people. Hey, you know well, what? So Sam Jackson is the the highest grossing actor of all time. But you know, yeah, that it is. helps when you cameo in you know fifteen you know Marvel movies, and you're in a Star Wars movie too. What? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> but let's touch on some of these non-universal monster movies that are very much universal monster movies. Uh, Hollow Man. Uh, that was the first one I immediately thought of when uh, when you were talking about doing this. I've never seen The Hollow Man. Kevin Bacon, though. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, Kevin Bacon plays such a dick in this movie. So very much fitting in The Invisible Man. Very movie. much so. You know, in that it's the, you know, they're basically stuck in this, you know, lab and whatnot. Nobody can get out. And, you know, he's taking all these people one by one because, well, you know, they made him an Invisible Man and now he's upset kind of thing. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, I've never seen it. I've it's come up quite a bit in the last week between your discussion. We discussed it a little bit on Killer Countdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's I've seen a couple of other articles pop up this week because Invisible Man is very much in the sure sure the, the talks right now. So I might check out Hollow Man. Um, it, I would say is it is it perfect? By all means, it's not. Is it at least worth the watch? Because I think I mean for the time that it came out, I mean. The, the special effects are okay. I mean, I think they do pretty well. You can definitely tell they did the whole, like, uh, uh, green screen aspect of digitally removing the guy in on the, on the makeup because mm-hmm. all the other stuff is makeup and all that stuff. Like, you can definitely tell that aspect of it. But, I mean, 
Welcome to CGI World. Yeah, early uh, what late '90s? They were just delving into that big time. So, mm-hmm. uh, some of the other ones that I've thought of. Obviously, let's jump into Monster Squad. Was one we definitely brought up. Do you think uh, that is very much based off the Universal Monsters? Uh, the the kids in the film are the kids that were going to watch. Yes. These movies and watch them growing up and stuff. So that's very much part of that film is the Universal original monster movies as well. And yeah, they all, that, again, that's why I, I love that movie so much because they treat all those characters with so much respect. Where Dracula's Dracula, the Wolfman's Wolfman, the Mummy's the Mummy, Frankenstein's monster is Frankenstein's monster. They're all mm-hmm. the, that character. They're never, you know, played up for jokes or anything like that or taken taken away from their original monster roots. So, The Monster Squad, one of my favorites. Available on Amazon Prime, it looks like. Yeah. I mean, everybody's probably seen this movie. I have never seen this movie. You've never seen Monster Squad? I've never seen Monster Squad. What? I know, that's why it's actually legit trying to see where it might be located at. Yeah, you should definitely watch Monster Squad. I hope it's telling me that it's on Prime. I'm afraid it's going to be like, it's on Shudder! Yeah, you definitely need to watch Monster Squad. Wolfman's got arts. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and Stephen King rules I I still need to buy that shirt that the kid wears oh definitely yeah uh, and then the other ones I, I've been thinking of again I brought up Young Frankenstein earlier it is very much it, it's, 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 a, it's a sequel to the Frankenstein movies uh, obviously um, he is playing like the grandson or great grandson of the original Dr. Frankenstein in the movie uh, played by Gene Wilder in this one such a funny movie. Gene Wilder is so perfect in the film. Again, it pays homage to those original monster movies. It uses the same set yeah. from Bride and the original Frankenstein, which is very cool. Um, yeah, it's very much part of that series while also kind of poking fun of it in well, a way, but a, also loving it very much. That was funny, Dead and Loving It. Um, I That's one thing I that, that makes Mel Brooks such a genius. In that, you know, he 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 does a very good job of playing homage without not necessarily... He, he, he's he not makes, bashing it. He's ever. not bashing it. He's making a good, fun comedy to basically embrace the genre, to embrace mm-hmm. the movies. Not to be like, your movies are bad and here's why I'm going to make them funny because they're bad. No, he's like, you know what, I'm going to make a good comedic version my version of frankenstein frankenstein frank oh yes frankenstein frankenstein yeah i love i love young frankenstein that was yeah that's one of my favorites Mm -hmm. that's why mel brooks is a genius Uh uh-huh and yeah they do they take the again he takes a lot from those that original universal series not just bride and and the original frankenstein but the plot, somewhat of a plot or whatever mm-hmm. is in Young Frankenstein, is pretty much the same plot of Son of Frankenstein. Right. So he takes a lot from all the, the sequels as well. So um, <coughs> The last one I want to bring up uh, is an Academy Award winning film based off one of the Universal Monsters. What's that? The Shape of Water. Dang it, you've, you've skipped over one person myself. What? Chevy Chase's Invisible Man. I've, I've never seen it. It's so much fun. Yeah. Him and Daryl Hannah. It is actually... I, and then we'll get to The Shape of Water, and I yeah, apologize. The, but The much better movie. I'm not arguing <laughs> that at all. But, I mean, it. it's a good... It's one of those ones where... Uh, I, I would call it not necessarily in the lines of saying the Chevy Chase movie is in the same lines of, of Mel Brooks in terms of the, the quality, if you will. But, you know, that they're, they're making a good, fun, Invisible Man movie with to pay respect to the originals, not to be like, I can make it better. That's the way I take it anyway. Yeah. yeah anyway, <laughs> Shape of Water. Uh, Shape of Water takes, <laughs> takes, <laughs> takes the story of the creature from the Black Lagoon. Again, updates it for a modern audience. Del- uh, Guillermo del Toro, the writer-director of the film, very much is a fan of these monster movies. Uh, has many of these monsters in his house as either collectible items or full-scale figures, or uh, I believe he does have a full-scale Frankenstein monster in his house. Mm-hmm. He very much lives in one of these movies. Oh, Del Toro? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't remember when it was or what I was watching or whatnot, but he did kind of a little bit of a, a tour of his house. Mm-hmm. I want it, that. I want to live in his, his house. His house is yeah. exactly what you would expect out of it. Yeah. The, 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 not necessarily gloomy as in like it's sad and whatnot, no. but like you can definitely tell his inspiration is in 
monster movies and the, that type of genre and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. The old Victorian stuff yeah, like that. I'm, yes. I'm jealous of his house. Yes. Like that's that's my dream home right mm-hmm. there. But yeah, Shape of Water obviously won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Um, yeah, it, it's a fantastic update of that original Creature from the Black Lagoon story. And it all stems from Del Toro watching Creature from the Black Lagoon as a kid. And seeing uh, Julie Adams swimming and the creature swimming underneath her and saying, that's a love story right there waiting to happen. And I want to see those two end up together, Mm -hmm. not her with her boyfriend. Right. And very much that's how the movie goes. And it's a just a really beautiful movie. Like if you haven't seen Shape of Water, there is. uh, Yeah, it's obviously people are like, well, she F's a fish. I'm like. That's, you're you're missing the point if that's what you take away from it. Yes, she does f a fish. That that is one of those things where you're just like, and that is what you took away from what I said. Yeah, and that's what. Yeah, it's it's people who. Yeah, I don't. I don't. We don't need to get into it. But uh, yeah, it's it's a truly just a really great love story and a great story about humanity and finding love, even though if you have. Uh, a disability like you can't you can't speak like the main character mm-hmm. in, in the movie or if you look like a gill man you know that's it's all I'm glad i don't look like a gill man yeah and there he is sitting right up there my brand new gill man pop uh, the amphibian man for oh, this like, what are you talking yeah. about right oh there he is right there hey, look at that little but guy. yeah that was i uh, again it's it's a taking these universal monster movies that he loved as a child and one best picture with it so yeah all stems back from these universal monster movies you get a little bit of del toro a little bit of uh alfonso caron get into uh bong john ho like all these like you know these foreign directors showing us americans up yeah a little bit yeah a little bit yeah it's good i like it and i love all the those three guys are killer they're three of the best directors working today and yes and you can even see Bong has quite a few monster influences in, in his films too. So, but we will I, talk about that in a upcoming well. And I was episode. Gonna, I was gonna say this for as many times as I kept saying, "I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna watch it." I finally got Parasite watched, and we will discuss oh, in a few weeks. It was fantastic. Yes, I would say one best picture. Right, and, and, and they got it right. And again, I'm I'm glad I was wrong, and I'm. Definitely glad I had an opportunity to watch it, and it is a fantastic film. And I encourage anybody, if you have not seen it, you need to watch Parasite. Yes, yeah, we will be discussing that film in full detail in a few weeks, though. Uh, but yeah, we're going to wrap up our Universal Monster discussion here. Um, yeah, Brian, do you have any other final thoughts on Universal Monsters before we, we, we wrap it up? No, but I did figure out, I looked it up finally and whatnot. Universal has been around for over 100 years. They actually are pretty much tied with Paramount being the oldest like ones out there. Mm-hmm. So, mad credit for a studio that's been around this long. Yeah, one of the big five, original big five studios back then. Yeah. All right, so let's wrap it up. Um, I'll leave with a few, I mean, go go watch the Killer Countdown. That's where your recommendations will come in. Oh, there you I'll go. leave it with that. So, yeah, if you guys want to figure out which one of these, I mean, like I said, there's 30-plus movies to watch out of this series. If you want to know which are the 12 essential ones to watch, maybe minus one. <laughs> to, to understand that reference, go check out the latest episode of The Killer Countdown, ranking the top 12 Universal Monster films. God, I kind of wish I would have been there for that. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Go check it out. All right. We're going to wrap it up with what we got coming up. We're going to give you a little sneak peek of what we got coming up in the next few weeks here. What is that? We're going to tease it up with next week's episode. We're going to bring it back to a different, uh, different year. A very important year for me because I was born this year. Uh, 1994, this was the year I was born. Brian, you, we'll, we'll discuss where you were at that time. <laughs> I was not being just born. Uh, yeah, so we, we thought it'd be fun uh, at a later date we were also going to discuss a different year that is very important to Brian at a different point. But yeah, yeah we're going to jump into 1994 movies. We're gonna just going to talk about what are some of the movies that still hold up today, what are some of the most important movies from that year. It's considered by many to be one of the greatest film years of all time. It definitely is. So yeah, we're going to jump into 1994 movies um, coming up next week. You missed a good year that you had to wait. I know, had to to wait. (laughs) 
then we'll we'll give a little preview since we did talk about Bong Jung uh, uh, Ho. We'll jump up to his episode here in, the, in a few weeks as well. Uh, the week after our 1994, we're going to be talking about some of the best non-Marvel and non-DC comic book movies in honor of Bloodshot with a Vinny Diesel coming out. So little Vinny Diesel, little Vinny Diesel. Uh, but yeah, we'll be talking about some of the best non-Marvel DC comic book movies ever, and we may have a special guest or two on for that one. I hate it when we have special guests I don't know about. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And then the week after, we will be talking Bong Joon-ho movies. So we thought it was a good time to finally talk about this man's filmography because he's in the, the pop culture scape finally now. Yes. Uh, after being a, a filmmaker for decades now. And yeah, so we're going to be talking about his filmography. Uh, you, me, and Blake Ginnathan. We'll be on that episode, so we'll be talking Bong Joon Ho movies. I gotta get caught up on a couple of them. You got some homework to do, Brian. You got you got a couple weeks though, so we're we're good on that. Uh, yeah, I'll do so, my best. All right, so yeah, that's what we got coming up in here the next few weeks. We'll be on the lookout for those episodes. But as I uh, mentioned, go check out the latest episode of the Killer Countdown, ranking the top twelve Universal monster movies. Uh, also check out our film friends Andy from Fat Dude Digs Flicks and Corey Jacobson Somewhat Random Movie Collection. Go check those guys out. Show them your support. Go check out their reviews and Corey's awesome and very strange <laughs> movie collection that I love so much. Uh, you can check out uh, this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, and YouTube. Yeah. And you can check us out on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Backlot605. And while you're on Facebook, join the South Dakota Film Community Group and join the conversation there. Uh, we love talking movies with with everyone on that page. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, one more thing I want to plug. We do have a T Public store as well, where you can buy a fancy Backlot 605 merchandise, including T-shirts, mugs, stickers, pillows, <laughs> banners, whatever you want to buy. It's on that store. Yes. And we do have some new designs on that as well. Yes. So that's why I wanted to plug it this week. Of course. A little more. Yeah. So we got some cool new designs. Go check it out right now on T Public and just search Backlot605 or follow us on Backlot605.com for our latest movie news, reviews, and discussions. And you can click on the merchandise tab on our website and that'll take you right to the T Public store. Yes. All right. Woo. Yes. I'm out of breath. You should be. You've been talking about monsters for like two hours. Monsters for a very long time. Brian, kick it off with, uh, not kick it off, round it off with where people can find you online. Uh, basically Instagram, so I can try to keep myself updated on that. I still have to... Like, What's your Instagram? LP Freak. Yes, LP see, that helps freak. people find you. <laughs> what? No. Um, yes. I do have to finish getting my thoughts down. I just recently finally got down to sit down and watch Rocket Man before I watched Parasite. So I still have to get down to writing those, getting those put up uh, for what little bits of knowledge I kind of throw out there. Um, on my letterbox, the same uh, LP Freak. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you can Mr. find your horror guy. Yeah. You can find me on Instagram, Casey underscore the horror guy. Uh, I am re- I'm reviewing every horror movie that I watch, including all of these universal monsters. I got to catch up on one. I got got to write the review for Creature from the Black Lagoon. And then I'm finally done with these movies for a while. Yeah. I'm ready to watch something else. As much as I love them, it's a lot to watch in, in a short amount of time. Yeah, like, again, yeah, at least they're only like an hour ish, you know. Yeah, if they were over an hour, I'm like, God, how long is this movie? <laughs> but yeah, this, yeah, if you want to check out my complete thoughts on all the Universal Monster movies, they're all on my Instagram right now, Casey underscore the horror guy. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for listening to the show. And if you could like, comment, rate, review, do all that fancy schmancy stuff, subscribe, do all that. Do it. it really helps us out a lot. Uh, if you're on Facebook and you follow us there, please give us a like. Please share. That yes. helps other people find us as well. So, yeah, I, if you can do all that fun stuff, we'd we'd really appreciate it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Who? Maybe yeah. maybe we get enough people to like us on YouTube that we can actually change our URL to a bunch of not being garbage. Yeah, a bunch of mumbo jumbo as you know. We uh, could just put YouTube dot or YouTube dot com slash backlot six oh five. Yeah, that's just YouTube though. We should we should do a whole episode on YouTube. How so? We can just discuss YouTube as a medium because <laughs> there's a there's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of in between. There's well. a lot of ugly. 
Yeah, so anyway, this anyway. has been the Backlot 605 Podcast. You can check us out each and every week doing movie reviews, movie discussions, talking random nonsense on movies. But until next time, for Brian Mensing, I'm Casey Kelderman, and we'll see you next time on the Backlot of South Dakota. Yeah.